We want to say welcome once again. We're glad that you're here. If you've come in since our first welcome, we're so glad that you've decided to be a part of our assembly today. We hope that not only do we worship God as he would have us to worship, that it will also be uh, upliftment and inspiration to you as well. We're just glad you're here. In the four Sundays between Mother's Day and Father's Day, we are studying some of the great marriages that we read about in the Bible. Last week we began this series with a very obvious choice and that is a study of the couple Adam and Eve. They had the first great marriage of the Bible uh, in a very literal way but it was a great marriage. By the way um, I want to mention that Matt, Matt Ingram told me afterwards in fact why he thought they had such a great marriage. He said it was because neither of them had a mother-in-law. I did ask Matt if I could throw him under the bus on that one, and he agreed that I could. So we started with Adam and Eve, and then uh, we're going to proceed now to uh, the next great marriage of the Bible, and that is the marriage between Abraham and Sarah. You probably are not surprised at that. Some might wonder, well, what about Noah? Good old Noah. Well, he, he in fact had a marriage. He, in fact, had a wife, but she's not named. She's just called Noah's wife. And while I would submit to you that Mrs. Noah was a great woman, a great person of faith, and in fact, they must have had a very, very strong marriage to get through what they had to get through. Since she's not named, uh, and since we don't know much about her, we're going to go on to the next woman uh, that's named in the Bible, and, and that is, of course, Sarah. After Eve, Sarah is the next woman, and of course, she is married to this great man of faith named Abraham. He's originally called Abram. She's originally called Sarai, and in just a moment, I want to introduce to you the passage that uh, we first read about them. If you want to go ahead and open your Bible, it's to uh, is to uh, Genesis chapter 11. That's when they first come on the scene in God's revelation of his, of his plan for us. And so one of the things we learn from Abram, Abraham, and as you'll see, Sarah, is that they are great people of faith. Uh, eventually, we're going to work our way over to Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to remind each other how great this marriage was and how strong their faith was. And, and while most of these lessons, I, I would say, uh, if you know where we're going, most of these lessons are going to deal with how we can have better marriages as we continue to go through these series. Uh, this series, uh, I want you to also know that if you're not married, that's okay. Uh, if you're not married, you can still learn from these lessons. Most people that aren't married plan to get married one of these days. But even if you're not married right now, if you're single, uh, this is a lesson I hope you will learn a lot from simply because uh, toward the end, I'm going to give you some things to take away that will be about faith. It's about Abraham and Sarah and their faith, but it's a lesson uh, for our faith as well. So I hope you turned over to Genesis chapter 11. Let's, let's just kind of see how this story starts to develop. We'll pick up in Genesis chapter 11 about verse 26. It says, Now Terah lived 70 years and begot or gave birth to Abram, Nahor, and Haran. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Aran, Haran begot Lot. And Haran died before his father Tehran, Terah, uh, in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai. Skip down to verse 31. It says, or verse 30 rather, but Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan and they came to Haran and dwelt there so the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran now you may wonder well okay why the traveling why did they do what they did well we're about to learn the reason when we get to chapter 12 but here we are introduced at the very same time to this great man of faith, Abram as he's called. And from here, henceforth, I'll probably just refer to him as Abraham, uh, unless I'm reading from the text, and he's called Abram. But here we're introduced to Abraham and uh, his wife, Sarah, who would uh, eventually be called Sarah. 
And what we see in this great couple is that uh, there was a, a partnership. This marriage was a partnership. Uh, their marriage illustrates, and this is what I th hope we're going to see today and learn today uh, for married people, their marriage illustrates how there will be ups and downs all throughout your marriage. The couple that's been married the shortest time here this morning or the couple that's been married the longest time here this morning, you're going to experience this. Those who've been married for a length of time already know this. There will be ups and downs in marriage. And it's beautiful to follow this couple who are praised for their faith, but I want you to see when we start talking about our faith a little bit later, how we ought to be able in a lot of ways to relate to their faith, to relate to their ups and downs, to their struggles as they had this marital experience. I really think that's what this is. It's a marital experience. And from this marital experience, uh, there are some things that I think we ought to highlight as we kind of look at the story of their marriage as it is revealed to us in Scripture. So that's what I want us to do for the next few minutes. I want us to begin by, first of all, noting that they experience life. When we first start reading about them, uh, and, and by the way, we don't, we're, we're not sure exactly how old they are when we first come across them, but we're introduced to them here in Genesis chapter 11. And as I said just a moment ago, um, although we know their names, we, we read a little bit more about Abram's or Abraham's father, Terah. And, and what he is going to do, he's going to pick up the family and, and start moving the family around. And, and they're going to eventually stop at the end of chapter 11 there. They're going to stop in this place called Haran. And then we pick up this part of the story in chapter 12. As we see how they start to experience life together. It says in chapter 12, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So now we're starting to pick up on his age. He was 10 years older than his wife, Sarah. She would have been about 65. I don't know if you noticed in the previous slide, but um, I kind of appreciated the idea there that Abraham looked a little older in that picture, but Sarah probably looked a lot younger. What we're going to learn about her is that she was a very beautiful woman. She was a very beautiful woman. And, and maybe even at 65, as, now, as she will be now, uh, she was still a very beautiful woman. And then it says this about her. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, verse 5 of chapter 12, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. What we're seeing here is how this couple, from the very beginning of what we know about them, we're experiencing a life together. Any of you ever moved? That is a part of life. Most people will move a few times during their life. And the first thing we read about them, other than the fact that she's barren, which is a big part of the story, and she can't have kids, the first thing we read about them is that they are going to be on the move. As a matter of fact, the life that they live together their experience of life was basically one of being a sojourner they moved from place to place and that was a little bit more common in those days for people to be uh, uh, of that way but this is the life that they experienced together one of the things that you've probably heard repeated at a wedding uh, is the statement that Naomi uh, that rather Ruth makes to Naomi words of devotion to Naomi these are usually repeated at weddings because they remind us of the devotion that it takes for two people to sojourn together through life and these are the words for wherever you go I will go wherever you lodge I will lodge your people shall be my people and your God shall be my God where you die I will die 
and there I will be buried. That's Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Those are appropriate words to describe this sojourning life experience of Abram and Sarah. Last week, I hope you remember that we noted that God said from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2 that it's not good for man to be alone. And so God said, when he saw Adam was alone, he said, I will make a helper comparable to him. One of the great uh, realizations of, of God in his creation that it wasn't appropriate for, for man to be alone. Later in Hebrew literature, in the, in the Proverbs, it would say this in Proverbs 18.22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Some of the translations say, he who finds a wife finds happiness and obtains favor from the Lord. Now, I think these verses, and there are other verses, they, they kind of highlight the idea that Judaism attaches to the importance of marriage. How that this is a sojourning experience when you go through life. You need your spouse. As a matter of fact, uh, many Jews believe that a person was not complete without a, a life partner. And what we learn in the New Testament is you can be single and you can still be pleasing to God. But in these olden times, though, people kind of associated completeness with being married to someone. Uh, Jewish rabbis would often speak to that. And so it, it shouldn't be a surprise to us that every time we read about Abraham doing something, there is Sarah right by his side. They're experiencing life together. They live life together. They, they seem to carry out and illustrate God's plan for marriage. As we noted last week, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two shall be one flesh. And that's exactly what Abraham and Sarah do. They cleave to each other. They're glued together and they're going to go through life together with all the ups and downs. You might compare them to peanut butter and jelly they just seem to go together everywhere they go in life they go together and, and we don't really know as I said earlier how old they were when uh, they first got married uh, we, we know eventually when the, the, their story in chapter 12 starts to materialize that uh, Abraham is 75 and she is 65 and so they go through this life experience together and I find it kind of interesting that in chapter 24, in verse 1, right after the fact that, that Sarah dies, after they'd gone through life together, the scripture simply says, now Abraham was old and well advanced in years. Maybe that speaks to some of you who've lost a spouse, how painful it is to go through life, to experience life together with an individual. They're your life partner, and now they're no longer there, and it makes you feel this way. And this is what Scripture says of Abraham. He was old, well advanced in age. He had a lot more time to go, as the, as the story will reveal. He lived longer than that, but it, it took the toll on him. And so what we learn is in, in marriage, just as God said from the very beginning, that a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is the great example of Abraham and Sarah in Scripture. They experience life. But they also experience something else, and this is probably the, 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 the main part of their life, uh, I guess you would say, and they experience crises. In the plural, they didn't have just one crisis. They had crises. And this is really the story of them in Scripture. Really from the very beginning, the first thing we learned about Sarah is she's barren. She can't produce children. She can't have children. And I would say that there are some of the couples in this congregation and you're going through that experience and you want children and you know what a crisis it is to you. That, that you want something, you want to be parents, and, you, and, and, you, and right now it just has not happened. This is the very beginning of, of their story. Um, for every believing couple that join in marriage together, there will be these ups and downs. And I just want to illustrate to you how although their lives are described as lives of faith they had so many downs they had so many crises uh, that, that they had to endure together 
It seems there are twists and turns in all marriages, but in this marriage, it's one crisis after another. As I said, it begins early on when we're introduced to them as being barren, and then the next thing we read about them is they're sojourners. They're, they, they, you know, every woman wants a home. Every woman wants to put down roots, but what we learn about about this couple is that they're constantly on the move. And so they began their sojourn from Ur of the Chaldeans to a temporary stop before they get to Canaan to Haran. Another crisis might be that it seems that Abraham's father didn't trust in God's direction for this. Abraham's father didn't trust God, didn't believe in God. As a matter of fact, Joshua chapter 24 and verse 2 uh, says that he was an idol worshiper. And so apparently he didn't believe in Jehovah God. He didn't believe in this plan to, to leave your country and, and go to the Canaan land. Some of you possibly are dealing with that kind of crisis in your life. Maybe the, the most important person in your life or a very, very important person in your life, they're not a person of faith. And I would encourage you just don't give up on them yet. Because sometimes it takes some longer than others to come to believe in God and to do his will. This must have been a very difficult time. And this is probably the reason at the end of chapter 11, they stop in Haran. They don't keep on going to Canaan. It may have been that this was Terah's protest and that I don't believe in God. And maybe he found a place that he was comfortable with his idol worship. And then as you keep going through their life, it's just one crisis after another. When they finally got to Canaan land, guess what? There's a famine, another crisis. And, and so they have to uh, go southward, and they go, according to chapter 12 and verse 10, down into Egypt, and that's going to present another crisis. Remember I said that, that Sarah was beautiful. She was really a beautiful woman. And so when they go down into Egypt, they, they, they have this plan to not tell the whole truth. And they, they lie about Sarah. They say that she's, she's his, wife, uh, his a sister instead of his husband, and, or rather wife. And so as a result, there's this crisis of dealing with, with that in their life. Uh, and then you go to chapter 13. Chapter 13. And, and, and this is the crisis of dealing with the, the feuding between Abraham's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen. And, and, and that is a difficult situation that has to be dealt with. In chapter 14, Abraham has to go fight a battle to um, rescue Lot. He's been captured by some, some enemies, and he has to go fight a battle. Maybe some of you have had a spouse to go off to war, and you know the pain and the uncertainty uh, and the challenge to your faith that that presents to you. Imagine how she felt on that occasion. Um, and then in chapter 15, uh, there, there's the renewal of the promise. Remember God had told him in chapter 12, as we read a, a moment ago, that you're going to be blessed. You're going to have descendants. And there's the renewal of that in chapter 15. But at the end of that renewal and that, that promise, guess what? No child still. Still childless. And then in chapter 16, there is the crisis of Hagar and Ishmael and for a lack of time, we can't go into that story, but that is a real crisis that they have to deal with. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. In chapter 17 and 18, uh, God is making a covenant with Abraham, but this, this covenant, though, is, is about this child that they're supposed to have, but guess what? They still don't have the child just yet. He restates the promise, and this is when they doubt God and laugh. Chapter 18 and 19 is the crisis of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Chapter 20 is another low moment of deception when they once again lie about Sarah being Abraham's wife. And finally you get to chapter 21. And God finally does, 25 years later, God finally does what he said he would do. And, and Abram, Abraham and Sarah, they become parents they are blessed with that child of promise Isaac but even during this triumphant time it's still a crisis because Hagar scoffs and Sarah demands that they be sent away into the wilderness and then what about chapter 22 can you imagine that crisis I will give to you the fact that Sarah is not mentioned in that story but 
the record does state that Abraham is told what to do with his son, Isaac. And it says the next day he got up and started the journey toward Mount Moriah. I have a sneaking feeling that something was up and Sarah knew it. And whether it was discussed or not, we won't ever know until maybe we can ask them in eternity. But something was obviously wrong. Could you sleep the night before if God told you to take your son, your son of promise, and go sacrifice him? That's the story in chapter 22. What, what I'm saying to you is, if you're married, you're going to have some good days, but there will be these times of trial in your life. People who believe in God and trust in God, they still struggle. We all have that in common. Some, sometimes uh, you listen to preachers and they will make you think that if you just trust in God, you believe in God, everything will work out, everything will be okay. Basically, you won't have any problems, that you'll be rich, you'll be happy, that, that God just will you know, take care of every little thing that's, that happens in your life and nothing bad will happen at all. But see, when you read Scripture... And, and you read the real record of people of faith, that's not the case. That is not the case. And so what I'm saying to you, if, if you're, you're married and you're kind of going through a difficult time in life, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you and doesn't care about you. And it also doesn't mean that you are not a person of faith because people of faith have these ups and downs. And theirs was a, a, an experience of crises, all throughout their marriage. But then, obviously, we come to what we would think is the best part of the story. And I would like to also remind you, thirdly, that they experienced victory. They experienced victory. We've established that they were sojourners. But it was not until Abraham bought a cave in which to bury his wife, Sarah, after she died, that he, that he ever owned anything in Canaan think about that he was promised this land an inheritance but he never truly owned the land it never became his and not until he bought that parcel of land to bury his wife in did he ever own anything in Canaan and so perhaps this illustrates the victory that they won it wasn't a victory measured in possessions or lands it was a victory of faith that is the victory. Abraham and Sarah lived a lifetime of great faith along with moments of not so great faith. But they remained faithful to each other and ultimately they were faithful to the Lord. The Bible and the song we sing declares faith is the victory. And that's the goal. That's the end game. If you're married or if you're not, Faith is the victory. But I want to remind you, as we get over toward the end of the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 11, the, the scripture was read just a little bit ago, but I think we ought to take one more look at this. Here is the record of men and women of great faith that's revealed to us in Hebrews chapter 11. And obviously, here we find Abraham and Sarah. Verse 8, Hebrews 11, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place in which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What a beautiful verse. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore what an incredible record of a faithful victory that they experienced now, I told you that you can learn some lessons from this. And I want to share some takeaways with you about Abraham and Sarah, whether it might apply to marriage or especially as it might apply to your faith, your own faith and how we can learn some lessons from them. The first of these lessons is that they believed 
but they needed a little help. They believed, but they needed a little help. In chapter 15, after God reiterates his plan for them to be blessed with descendants and, and not the servant Eleazar, that's kind of what they were thinking at that moment. Well, maybe it'll be through Eleazar. No, God says, that's not the plan. After he reiterates them for them to have a child, which would later be Isaac, the text says, and Abraham believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness a very familiar verse to all of us he believed the lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness but sometimes we don't read on to the next verse verse 8 says that abraham said lord how shall i know that i will inherit it he essentially asked the Lord to help him understand. I, I, I need more information. Please help me understand. And I think that is the nature of faith. We struggle with it. Even when we believe, we still struggle with it. And we feel like we need more help. And I would just say, if you're a person of faith and you're struggling, and it doesn't mean that you don't believe. It just means that you're human. Because, see, we walk by faith the bible says in the new testament not by sight anybody can walk by sight anybody that has eyes and they can see where they're going they can put one foot in front of the other and they can walk by sight but people of faith walk by faith which means you don't see where you're going so it doesn't mean that you don't believe if you're struggling sometimes you just say help me lord i, I need your help the second lesson we learned, they believed, but then they tried to help out God. I think this is a really important thing for us to realize. In chapter 16, after accepting the plan and making a covenant with God, Abraham goes along with the plan that's not God's. You remember the story. They essentially try to add their own human action to God's plan. As Sarah suggests, well, Abraham, why don't you take my servant Hagar and have a child with her? And that's what happens. That's when Ishmael is born. Perhaps this really illustrates the difference in faith and human effort. We sometimes struggle to differentiate. Sometimes people want to call obedience human effort. But obedience to what God says is never human effort. It's just obedience. True faith involves obedience. It says in Hebrews that when Abraham was called to go out into that country, he, he obeyed. That's not human effort. That's obedience to God. Human effort is an addition or perhaps a subtraction or some adjustment on our part to what God said. And in their case, they said, let's, let's you know, maybe God's struggling to get this plan going. Let's help him out. I want to tell you, God doesn't need help with his plan. His plan is perfect. And so we just stay out of that. To do what he tells us to do is obedience. To do anything else, if we add or take away or adjust, that's human effort. And that's what we should not do. The third lesson, they believed, but they were impatient. See, see, all of these years are going by. They're 75 and 65, and, and they, we're going to have a child. After all these years, we're going to have a child how many nights did they, they lie in bed together and, and talk about how well, we're, we're going to have a child? And all these years kept going by. And they never quit believing. But oh, how they were impatient in their belief. And, and so if you find at times you're struggling with God's timing, guess what? It doesn't mean you don't have faith. It means, again, you're human and we struggle. And that's the example even of this great couple. But then finally, th this final lesson is they believe God, but God still surprised them. They believe God, but, they st but God still surprised them. On, on, in this record, we could go and read the scripture, but I'll just tell you that at one point when, when Sarah hears how she's going to, as an old woman, conceive, you remember what she does? She laughs. And, and the record also states that, that Abram, or Abraham, laughed. And yet God finally says, I'll show you. My plan is no laughing matter. I will show you. 
they they believed God but God still surprised them it it, it took that 25 years but God finally said I will show you and I just want to remind all of us that that God's plan is no laughing matter God's plan even though it may seem like it's taking some time to come to pass in our lives it is not something to scoff at or to laugh at because God is a sovereign God he's in control of this world and he's in control of our lives as we live lives of faith so many great lessons we can learn from this wonderful couple, this powerful duo of faith in the word of God. I think ultimately though what we learn, what we learn is there were ups and downs, but they made it and they were successful because of their faith. I hope that you are a person of faith. I hope that you can resonate in some way with what we've talked about today even if you're not married I hope that you've learned something about your faith and how it can be uh, pleasing to God yet at times you may feel like you're struggling in your faith that's entirely normal I would say maybe you're struggling to the point that you need some prayers maybe you're a person of faith but yet you haven't you haven't fully obeyed perhaps you understand God's plan for you today is to be immersed to be baptized everything is prepared and you can do that and we would gladly assist you in fulfilling God's plan for your life to start right now today to be baptized and to become a Christian we'd love to be able to assist you in doing that we'll be waiting here at the front a couple of our shepherds will be at the rear near the library if you'd like to uh, talk with them Uh, and we're going to stand and sing this song together if you need to come please do right now as we stand and as we sing 